hard to explain that. That's bothered me to this day. What the hell was that? Welcome to Mr. UFO Hunter. If you've had an encounter, contact me at MrUFOHunter at gmail.com. Let's get on with the show. Hello everyone, and welcome to Mr. UFO Hunter. This evening, I would like to outline, to the very best of my ability, precisely what happened to me and my family in September of 2014, when we encountered a UFO up close and personal, which returned over three consecutive nights. There is so much to explain, and it does get bizarre, which makes it quite tricky to put into words. Even now, after all this time. But most of all, how do you tell someone something that sounds crazy without sounding like you're actually crazy? I assure you I'm not. I place honesty and integrity above all else in my life with no mental health problems or anything of that nature. And so please bear with me, no matter how strange some of this may sound. So just to give you a little background information on where we are geographically and a little bit of history briefly. I had been living in several countries for some time uh, from Switzerland, Geneva in Switzerland, beautiful place. And then into the mountains of France in the Alps, the Haute Savoie, Je parle Francais aussi. Um, in a little town, little village called La roche saint which is close to Chamonix Mont Blanc. Beautiful. Anyway, I'm getting sidetracked. So, I'd lived in Spain, Madrid, Barcelona, all over the place. And I'd come back to England because I had children here from a previous relationship that I missed deeply while I was away. I came back here in the year 2010. And that's why I came to this particular town, Peterborough. Peterborough is in a place or part of England called East Anglia. And it's a pretty desolate place. I mean, Peterboroughians might not like me for saying this, but it really doesn't have many opportunities here. It's not a great, great place to be. But there are some places nearby which are actually quite nice Stamford, for example, we're close to that. But more specifically, where we had moved into this particular house in a bit of a rubbish area to live, really. But we'd moved in here in the year 2013, in October 2013. And so what occurred later was in late September, I think in the late tw like 22, 27 for the month of September 2014, so we'd been living here for several months. Out the back of the house is a road. Um, over the other side of that is a very small number of houses. And then you're directly in the countryside. Um, again, like I said, it's pretty flat. And if you continue down there, you had, there's a little tiny place called Marham. Continue from there will eventually lead you to a place called Stamford is a really old place pretty quaint nice place to be to see so that's where we uh, were living at the time and we're 
we're still here now. A place called Bryn Mawr in Breton, in Peterborough, in the United Kingdom. So that sets the scene. I'm a father of four. I have three much older children, two girls and a boy, Sade, Chanel, Corbin, and I have a, a young boy now, who's now six years old, called Blake. He lives with us and the others have all moved out. My daughter Chanel has uh, three boys, uh, my grandsons, and there you go, it sets the scene, right? So, at the time I was a self-employed web designer, but I have done many things in my time. Um, like I say, in Switzerland I was working in the Forex investment markets. Uh, I grew up poor in London, single mother, me, my brother and sister, um, absolutely no money. And we did well at school, but we were moved around a lot. And then eventually we were moved to go live with our father for a year and a half, two years. Um, and I was a young dad myself. I was only 18 when my daughter Chanel was born. Um, it was, me and the mother were together for 11 years. When we split up, that's when I, you know, was, I was off to, I took a job, which I never thought I'd get as a trainee stockbroker, but I got it and I flew out to Madrid and the rest is history. So when I came back here, um, I was a national account manager for a couple of years and I loved that job, a company called Hobart, some great people really fantastic job um, got to go to lots of hotels and restaurants high-end places in london in central london and all over the country in fact from lloyd's bank um, i've worked separately at lloyd's bank in it as well when i was young and a data center so i've done a lot of very varied things um, i speak a couple of languages um, i had great grandparents when i grew up that really really enticed and influenced me and my brother and sister to you know, really aim high and do well for yourself. My whole family virtually, prior to me, <laughs> to my generation were in the military. My grandfather on my mother's side was in the Merchant Navy. His brother was in the RAF. Um, my, on my father's side, my father was in the Territorial Army. His father was in the Army. And um, it just goes on and on. My, my great-grandmother was on my mother's side worked in Woolwich Arsenal. Her daughter, um, my grandma, um, was evacuated during World War II in the Blitz in London. Most of my family are from London. Again, until later generations, my dad moved up here to Peterborough and stayed here to start a business. So uh, setting the tone, um, telling you everything about myself, but what I'm trying to get at here is who I am as a person and where I was at when this happened. And you know, like I say, I, I've never been particularly, particularly religious of any particular uh, inclination, but as a child, I, I always had a sense of, um, you know, something greater. We were lucky enough, my grandparents took us on holiday every couple of years, which was the most incredible memories of my life back then, and have stayed with me forever. Um, of going to Greece, ancient Greek places, Athens, Simi, Samos, Crete, all of these absolutely wonderful places and um, very special to me in my memories. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's it really. So, that's me. Anyway, let me tell you, <clears throat> let me tell you about what happened back then, okay? And here we go, the full picture. Thanks for listening. I must preface this also with the fact that I have never had any interest in the subject whatsoever prior to any of this happening, but I've come to realize that it has caused me a certain amount of PTSD. And I normally pride myself on how strong-minded I am after a well-traveled and fairly tough life. But even now, I can't stop thinking about what happened every night and day, no matter what I am doing and no matter how much time has gone past. It's become a complete obsession and I'm now actually fed up with having it on my mind so much. 
It keeps him awake at night and it fills up far too much of my thinking every day. I just have far too many questions with no answers, which makes it the most frustrating thing I've ever experienced since I can't get any closure. I was hyper reluctant to tell anyone at the time. However, I did consider calling the police or even trying to contact the military bases nearby, which is RAF Wittering and RAF Alconbury. But I worried that I wouldn't be believed, and so I didn't. This was also because the initial encounter and interaction felt so very personal that I genuinely felt like it wasn't supposed to be shared. Now, I know that makes no sense, but I'll explain why. I must say, I have many serious regrets about how I handled what happened at the time, because not only did I not want to take my eyes off of the thing for even a split second, but I felt also that when I did consider taking a photo or shouting out for help, that I'd messed up somehow. I also had an incredibly rubbish phone back in 2014, a Nokia something or other, with a physical push-button keyboard and an ultra-low resolution camera built in. So, instead, I opted to take it all in with 100% of my focus and attention rather than stumbling around for a low-light, low-quality image instead. I hope that makes sense. However, I really did not consider enough, I think, in those precious moments just how badly I would later come to regret not recording something, no matter how unnecessary and wrong to do so it appeared at the time. I have since made some sketches, which I've added to this video. I've also included a couple of screenshots of the exact same object which I later found was seen elsewhere in the world back in 2011, along with some other relevant information, but more on that later. There's a lot to take in, I know, uh, and I'll explain everything that happened now here in full and chronological order. So, on the first night, it's late in September 2014, at around roughly 11.30pm, my daughter Chanel, who was 17 at the time, who lived with me, was standing outside with her friend, our neighbour's daughter, and they both watched several balls of light moving around erratically in the sky, making strange formations. They were changing speed, direction, and colors near our home. Some of them shot off at a high rate of speed and others blinked out. She told me about this the next day as I was asleep at the time, and she didn't want to wake me up. That following night, I was working from home very late into the night and the early morning hours, I was a self-employed web designer at the time, and once I'd finished my work at around 4 a.m., I was looking forward to going to bed. First, though, I stepped into my back garden to smoke, and as I sat on a garden chair, noticing just how clear and cloudless the night sky was, and cold, the starry night lit up with a brilliant flash of white light. It was a double flash in quick uh, succession. Of course, my initial reaction was simply that it must be lightning, but as there were no clouds or humidity, I thought it was really odd. But then, just as I was thinking that, it happened again. Another double flash of pure white light, and as I looked directly up above me, two spheres of white light travelling side by side appeared into my view, seemingly no more than 100 feet or so above me, and they were headed from behind my seated position heading west at a medium rate of speed. They then flashed again and made a right angle turn to what was my left due south and suddenly shot off at an unbelievably fast, like a bullet from a gun speed over my rooftop, which left what appeared like visible trace lines. I immediately got up and ran through the house to the front door, looking around the sky for them, but saw nothing. I hung around for a few more minutes, which is when I noted the time, which was around 4.10 in the morning, and I assumed they must have been what my daughter had seen the night before, and I couldn't wait to tell her that I must have seen the same thing too, whatever they were. It was really amazing and bizarre. So finally I decided it was time for bed and headed inside the house. 
Now this is when it gets really, really weird. As I stepped inside, closed and locked the front door, I began to put my foot on the stairs and hand on the banister to head up. But at that very moment, I was stopped in my tracks by what I can only describe as a telepathic instruction. It was an instantaneous, powerfully crystal clear, stunning moment. I mean, words really cannot describe this easily at all. It was not a voice, not in words, but instead a pure packet of information. A communication that did not emanate from within my mind, and I instantly recognized it as not coming from within my own thoughts or from within myself. And this, of course, completely shocked me deeply. I've never had anything like that happen before or ever since. It was unraveled as or translated into very clearly, don't close the door, go outside and look up. And so I did. And as I did so, the most beautiful golden object moved out from over the roof of the house and stopped above me, just slightly off to my right. Had I estimate four or maybe five stories up in height? The object was roughly 30 or 40 feet across, as big as a bus. It had extruding shards of vertical light above and below it in the center, which gave it almost a horizontal diamond or spinning top shape. Its outside edges were fiery, like a moving plasma engulfed it, with the edging more of a fiery golden color, and beyond that, which moved as if the air around it was quite literally on fire. But I didn't feel any heat, and you could tell that it was encompassing a solid object underneath. It was so super bright that it should have burnt my eyes, tantamount to looking directly at the sun in terms of brightness, but yet somehow gentle to look at. The luminescence was odd, and I knew that I had never seen that type of light before. It was absolutely stunningly beautiful. The word awesome, or any words for that matter, simply cannot do it any justice whatsoever. They really don't. At this very moment of stepping outside and seeing this, an awful lot happened at once. The air was electrified with static. It was thick, like being bathed in it. Every hair on my body was stood on end from top to toe. I remember specifically looking down at my left arm as the tingling up and down my spine and across my scalp, along with the hair standing on end, were overpowering. But it felt kind of nice. At the same time, I was filled with not only the sense of absolute awe, but also, strangely, a feeling of love. So much so that my eyes watered a little with a happy tear, the kind I've only ever experienced before at the birth of my children. But above all else was that feeling of being intimately observed, watched, which was so extremely overwhelming that it felt like an absolute connectedness and made me feel as if from the moment it instructed me to go outside, it was somehow still connected to my mind and thoughts, to my very being. I felt it clearly. Now I understand that that sounds like a subjective perspective, but it really was as real as the rest of it, as what I was seeing and physically feeling. Needless to say, I was dumbfounded, staring up at it, utterly speechless, shocked and amazed. The object was completely silent, and likewise, everything else around me had fallen deathly silent too. You could hear a pin drop. It was so unique. As I stood there, after a few moments, I began to realize that I had no idea what I should do or say. I didn't know what would happen next. I mean, what now? So stupidly, and I laugh myself to this day about this. All I could do, think to do was to wave and I mouthed the word hi and smiled. I mean, what else was I to do, you know? After a few moments being observed in such an intimate and utterly silent way, I began to feel a little bit awkward and my thoughts suddenly realized, you know, oh my God, no one's ever going to believe this. I also momentarily considered that maybe this could be dangerous somehow. 
And what if no one knows what's happened to me if something bad does happen? I needed someone else to see this too. So I considered in a flash a few options. As I looked and saw that the front door was still half open, I thought maybe I should run into the house and quickly try to wake everyone up to come and see it too. But that wouldn't have worked. So then maybe I should shout out loudly into the house, but no. Then I thought, what about my neighbours? I looked around and saw no lights on, no noise, just stillness and silence. None of these options felt appropriate. I felt as if what I was thinking to do were completely unacceptably wrong. I then remembered that I had my phone in my top left coat pocket and that I should maybe try to take a photo or video. But at the very second that I thought this, I could swear that it knew what I was thinking in real time. And at that precise moment, it began to move to my left, due east. I really did feel like I'd messed up and that it was my fault that it was now leaving. So I began walking under it as it began speeding up. I began to jog along the short pathway here and then had to quickly start running to keep up as I said out loud, no, no, please don't go. It curved to the right and began rising higher and higher, speeding up faster and faster up into the sky. I ran into a dead end due to the terraced houses there ahead of me and I knew it was too late and it was not coming back down. It was clearly leaving. And so I watched it zip up until out of sight and gone. I know the time was around uh, 4.40 to 4.45 a.m. And so the whole thing lasted from beginning to end around 30 minutes or so. I stayed up, pacing the house, knowing that my girlfriend would be waking up at 6 a.m. to go to work. I was an emotional and nervous wreck. I was so scared to try to say what had happened because I didn't think anyone would believe me. I mean, it was so incredibly unbelievable even to me. And yet I knew it was real, and that's what made it so difficult. I couldn't process it. I didn't know what the hell had just happened. What was it? Why? How? All those questions which I still have to this day. The telepathy part of this makes it all the more unbelievable. I thought even my daughter or girlfriend would think I was nuts. When my girlfriend came into the kitchen to make coffee and saw me in shock, I really broke down and cried. I mean, literally stumbling for the words to even begin. It was horrible. And thank goodness she hugged me and she believed me. Little did she know that she would be about to experience something similar with me a few days later. I eventually tried to sleep. By that point the sun had come up and I remember laying in bed with my mind completely blown. I spent hours feeling ecstatic. It was Really, an emotional roller coaster. The following night, I purposefully stayed awake all night, watching and hoping it would return again. And to my excitement, it did. It returned at roughly the same time as before, around 4.15 in the morning. This time, however, I watched it come into sight whilst I stood at the front door of my home as it moved slowly, roughly 50 metres above the rooftops of houses, about 150 to 200 metres away to my right, that's in the west, heading in a southerly direction. It then turned abruptly to mine and its left, heading east, now along rooftops. I called my girlfriend on my phone, trying to wake her up a few times, once more completely mesmerised. She groggily half asleep, finally answered, but didn't want to get up. And so, although I didn't want to miss it, I decided to run inside the house up the stairs to get her up, but by the time I'd gotten back down the stairs, it was already too late. It was heading up to the same point in the eastern sky, moving higher and faster until out of sight within a few seconds. I remember thinking, my God, all of these people are asleep in their beds in those homes, and nobody is aware of what's literally just meters above them. On the third night, this time, I insisted that my girlfriend got up and super early to stay with me in case it came back. There was no way that I wanted to be alone again. It was incredibly important to me that she saw it too. Selfishly, to prove to myself and her that I hadn't gone completely insane, to be honest. 
it felt a bit na- nightmarish at the time, and it still does, that I've had something so dramatic happen to me, and I can't prove it, let alone to anyone else, that it all sounds so nuts. And that, all by itself, that is the single most difficult thing to deal with, even beyond the events itself, and still is, seven years later. So let's just say I gave her no choice in the matter. She was getting up this time and staying with me. So I was going back, uh, I was going from the back garden to the front of the house, in and out, watching the skies anxiously, waiting and hoping. My girlfriend was making coffee. I don't remember the exact time, but I do remember that it was significantly past the time that it had previously passed by. I remember getting worried that it was getting too late and light. As the dawn was breaking and the skies had turned lighter, I began to panic, thinking it's game over. Then, finally, it arrived from the back garden, this time coming in from the opposite direction than the night before, over to our eastern side, but moving in again from the same north to south heading. It came down diagonally this time, from up higher than previously, and just stopped when it reached the same distance from the rooftops as before. It was a little farther away from us than the night before too, maybe 250 to 300 meters away. So I shouted out to my girlfriend, Hannah, and told her to come here quick. I picked her up for her to see it over the fence line. She's only five foot two. She saw it and my goodness, what a relief that was. And she said too, oh wow. It was brilliant and super bright, fiery, just as before completely recognizable in an instant. Within maybe three seconds of being completely stationary, we watched it zip line diagonally upwards, heading east, increasing in speed until it was lost. We couldn't see it over the rooftop. So we ran to the front of the house to see it disappear into the highest distance until gone. I really was thrilled and relieved at the same time. I was vindicated at last. So, Following that third night, I never saw that object again, not until I found it on several videos of one single event online, but more about that later. Anyhow, several days passed since the third night. We were experiencing some very bad weather with extremely strong winds. One of these nights, I was driving down the road, maybe half a mile away. I glanced over to my left as I approached a roundabout and noticed immediately a bright red ball of light sitting completely stationary against the wind, directly above high tension power lines that I knew were there. After a double take, I pulled the car over and jumped out. I looked at it for several seconds and then decided to this time grab my camera, which was in my jacket pocket on the passenger seat. So I came around the front of the car to open that door so as to keep my eye on it the whole time. I quickly reached in and grabbed the jacket, and as I was stood there fumbling to get the phone out of the jacket pocket, still with my eyes focused on the red sphere, it literally blinked out and disappeared. It was too late. I waited for a few moments, but nothing else became visible. Eventually, I left. It must have been easily six foot across. It's difficult to tell if it was a solid object, as it was so bright. I do not remember, however noticing whether or not it was illuminating nearby structures, unfortunately. But being that it was over a rail track behind a car dealership, which was closed, I wouldn't have been able to see any reflective illumination of other objects from my viewing position. On the other side of those rail tracks are the backside of a large shopping precinct area made up of stores such as uh, H&M and Next, which were also closed at that time of night. Some time had now passed again since seeing that ball of red light over the nearby power lines. I cannot remember how much time now, I'm afraid. I wish I'd have kept a diary or something. So, one night, again before bed, myself and my girlfriend were out into the garden to smoke. We sat on two garden chairs, rested up against the exterior of the living room wall, facing the rear fence line of our garden. Behind the rear fence of our garden is a tree line which runs parallel left to right to a 40 mile per hour road called Breton Way. Everything was perfectly normal until all of a sudden, out of nowhere, a sudden and complete silence fell over us with a feeling of utter 
dread, and an unnaturally claustrophobic feeling of being watched. The hairs on the back of our neck stood up on end instantly. But how could this be? I thought, what's going on? These were the same feelings that I had felt under the object, but this time, instead of good, this felt really bad, extremely ominous, and quite frankly, damn scary. My girlfriend Hannah felt it at the same time and turned to me and said, babe, worryingly, and at that moment, what can only be described as overly loud, unnaturally super heavy, booming footsteps slammed the ground from behind the fence line from both the left and the right at the same time, heading towards the gaps where we can see straight through quite clearly the fence panels. Another footstep closer, and then another. At this point, whatever was approaching us should be visible, and yet there was nothing there. It was frightening, as if intentionally so. She got up and ran inside of the house. I'm sorry, babe, I can't, she said as she left. Me, I sat frozen, quite honestly with fear, stuck to my chair, but becoming rapidly angry at the threatening nature of what was happening. I shouted through my gritted teeth, come on. And with one last footstep on both sides, I sat absolutely still, not taking my eyes off of that fence line, not even to blink with chills running up my spine. There was silence. And after a few more seconds, the feelings, as quickly as they had arrived, suddenly lifted. Normal background sounds returned and the fear dissipated instantly. I waited a few more moments before walking over to the fence and looking over. And there was nothing there. Nothing at all. I mean, what the hell was that? To this day, that makes no sense. What was that? And why? One day in mid to late March of 2015, a full five or six months after the original encounter, my teenage son, Corbin, left his mother's house, my former partner, and moved in with me and my girlfriend Hannah, who had just given birth to our youngest son Blake on the 17th of March 2015. That helps me place the date for this. Behind our home in Bryn Mawr, Breton, Peterborough, only a couple of hundred metres away of that, there are fields and patches of woodland that are owned by the Milton Estate, next to a crematorium which leads to a very small village called Marrow. I used to regularly take walks in those woods and at the time I had started a YouTube channel called The Chill Out Zone, where I recorded the sounds of nature from those woods, among other places, to upload to YouTube and SoundCloud. On this one particular bright yet chilly day at around 1300 hours, I asked Corbin to come for a walk with me through the woods to relax and chill out and chat. And so we went across the farmer's field and around to the back of the woods to the usual spot where you can enter the woodline. But as we were just maybe three or four meters away from entering, that non-mistakable, dreaded and claustrophobic feeling and eerie ultra silence suddenly fell exactly like before. It was the middle of the day for crying out loud, but it hit me hard out of the blue. My son Corbin, who was to my left, had also stopped dead in his tracks and asked me, Dad, do you feel that? I said, yes, do you feel it too? He said, yes, which at that point seriously worried me as he confirmed that it was a feeling that was being shared, not just me, which meant only one thing. As I recognized those things as warnings from previous recent events, I suddenly became aware of the other side, that overwhelming feeling of being watched. And this time, like in the garden, the feeling was again one of danger. I looked around, scanning inside of the woods, wondering what that could be of danger to us. It doesn't make any sense. I couldn't see anything. And then that sense of being watched, as strange as still as this may sound, had a distinct direction to it. It was coming from up above over my right shoulder from the sky. I looked up and caught a glimpse of something very dark and large that darted behind the only huge puff white cloud in the whole entire sky. 
I stared up at that cloud for what felt like many minutes, waiting for a plane or a balloon or something to exit the other side. All sides of that cloud were clearly visible, but nothing came out. Without taking my eyes off of it, I asked my son Corbin, did you see that? He said, literally word for word, I remember it that clearly. It was like a, a big black, um, what do you call it? A, a can shape, like a cylinder thing. It went behind that cloud, he said. I really did feel like we were in imminent danger if we stayed any longer. And so I grabbed his arm and immediately we made our way out of there as fast as we could go. Although that place is close to homes and road, it is isolated. From that particular location where we were standing, it is not possible to be seen from the road. It's obscured by high thick hedges and the houses are completely out of sight. That experience concerned me to say the least and leads to so many questions. Where does that feeling come from? Is it emanating from within us as human beings as a recognition of danger? But if so, what exactly sets it off and how? Or is it being projected upon us intentionally as some kind of test or even a prank? If so, then why? What could possibly have been in those woods that I should be avoiding? What the hell was that dark cylindrical object that seemingly hid behind the cloud? And again, why? Where was it from? What did it want? None of it makes any sense. That same night, my son had gone out to stay at his friend's house overnight. The following bright, sunshiny but cold day, I was alone with my newborn son Blake in the living room of our house. My baby Blake had been asleep on the sofa but then he woke up crying. So I went over to pick him up and comfort him. And as I did so, I noticed out of the corner of my eye, something dark in the brightly lit room move, which caught my attention over to my right. I looked over and saw the figure of a small person, clearly about the height of a six year old child, halfway up the door frame, just above halfway over the door frame, about three and a half foot tall, stood directly in that doorway between our living room and our kitchen. As I stared directly at it, it literally glided or zoomed right across the, the room, pretty fast and out of the back door directly opposite. But this figure, for want of a better description, was occupying a three-dimensional space, yet was a slightly translucent dark shadow. It was not a projected shadow moving along the wall or a trick of the light. It was an actual person shape. It moved as if it glided, no bobbing up and down and did not, I didn't notice any leg movement as it moved. It literally made my heart skip a beat, pounding in my chest and made me jump out of my skin as I yelled out in fright. I mean, it scared me half to death. The next day, when my teenage son came home, as I was upstairs busy, I hadn't told him about what I had seen yet. He yelled out to me and came running up the stairs. He was frantic and breathlessly scared, saying, Dad, Dad, I was just in the living room doing my hair, and this thing just ran across the living room behind me in the mirror. He described the exact same thing that I had seen. I then told him what had happened the day before. He began to stay out a lot after that. He was convinced that the house was haunted, and sadly, his friend later died not long after that period at the time, at only age 13. My son Corbin became convinced that he had been seeing ghosts. I think it had been something to do with the UFO personally, but who knows? He later moved away from home and unfortunately something to do with the UFO personally, but who knows? He later moved away from home and unfortunately we haven't spoken in some time. So by 2016, after my business failed, I switched careers entirely and went into the construction sector for three and a half years. I hated it, and I'm now studying towards a bachelor's degree full-time whilst beginning to work part-time in the hope of re-entering the investment sales arena where I previously worked for many years. So in the summer of 2017, whilst on a construction site in Peterborough next to the main power station, on an exceptionally hot day, I remember that, I noticed a dark metallic looking ball hanging low in the sky about 60 feet up. It was spherical in shape, and although I parked near to a loud piling rig machine, I could not make out any noise in the moments of quiet, 
and could see that it did not appear to be a balloon or a drone. At times the object was completely stationary, but occasionally would move off to one direction and stop again. I began to record a video of it on my phone whilst being acutely aware I could be called to work at any moment, and all the while knowing that the kind of people I work with would definitely not be interested. And so I continued to film it as long as possible without raising any attention to it. I recorded the object for roughly 20 plus minutes until eventually watching it leave over the tree line and out of sight. In 2018, either close to or just after the summertime I think, because I remember it was nice and warm that night as I had my windows wound right down and open. I was driving a vehicle back towards Peterborough from the Wisbeach direction along the A47, coming up towards a thorny exit, which is a 70 mile an hour stretch of dual carriageway and it has a very limited number of hard shoulder spots to pull into. It was night time. As I was driving along, minding my own business, I glanced over to my right at about 45, 60 degrees and noticed what I initially thought was a small plane in trouble. It came down and dropped so low to the ground at a fair distance of around 500 meters away over flat fields in the direction of the Thorny Golf Center. I then watched it and noticed quickly that the three blinking steady fixed lights were not seemingly attached to anything and there were no other colored or blinking aircraft type lights around them in any way. They were simply in a horizontal formation, heading directly across the field, coming my way. They became so close that by now I could clearly recognize that they were similar to the red and the white ball of light that I'd seen before, but three of them together. And as I listened closely, I heard no noise. Nothing holding them together, not Chinese lanterns, not drones, simply balls of amber light. I desperately wanted to pull over and was adamant I would if I could so as to take a photo or video. But as I looked for a place to stop the vehicle, there was none. The objects passed directly overhead, extremely close to the vehicle, only within a few meters above me. They were as big as a beach ball, maybe a slightly bigger and perfectly silent. They quickly went over the hedge line to my left, which behind that is Wisbeach Road, and out of sight towards the direction roughly of Whittlesea, behind Thorny. They must have been traveling at approximately 30 to 40 miles an hour, maybe even quicker, I would guesstimate, for them to have traveled or covered the distance that they did in the same time that they did to perfectly intercept with my vehicle. I don't know what to make of that, I really don't. Why would I be seeing these things over and over like this, spanning a couple of years? I mean, right place, right time, but I mean, multiple times? Surely not. I mean, am I paying more attention to the sky more or something else? Again, I, I just don't get it. So one night in November of 2019, my daughter Chanel, who now lives with her boyfriend Jordan, and is a mother of three young boys herself, messaged me to let me know that a, a local man, who I shall not name here, had posted into a Facebook group chat for the Breton community that he had had a bizarre encounter whilst walking his dog nearby late at night. His post described that he had watched two balls of light dancing around with a third ball joining in until they eventually all shot off straight upwards into the sky at high speed. I asked my daughter to contact the man on my behalf, as I do not use Facebook myself personally, so as to offer him my mobile telephone number and request that he contact me to discuss what he'd seen. But unfortunately, he never did respond. So this possibly points to a re repeated return to the area spanning multiple years, right? But if so, then the question is why? I have no idea if it's relevant or what relevance this may have, but it is worth noting that in 2014 to 2015, there was a low level radiation waste dump site opened up not far from here at Kingscliff, completely against all of the local residents requests. They didn't want it there. Also, we are very close to two RAF bases, military air bases, 
that's RAF Wittering and RAF Alconbury. Where we live, there are lots and lots of open fields and agricultural land heading between our address towards Stamford. So, anyway, I had become by this time, of course, completely obsessed with trying to absorb as much information as possible uh, on the subject. I looked online for anyone else that might have seen the same thing or have had a similar experience. I started quickly to realize, of course, that the internet and YouTube is full of hoaxes and CGI videos with the occasional sprinkling of something which could actually be genuine. I did, however, eventually come across Jacques Vallée and I purchased one of his books, which really helped me at the time. And then one day, daytime, I remember so clearly the moment that I found it. I recognized it immediately and I was struck with a rush of emotions and shock. It was the exact same object. I couldn't believe my eyes all over again. It was exactly the same. Same observable characteristics, same behavior, spinning top, top shape with vertical shards of light emanating from the center above and below it. Same colors with the fiery moving plasma effect around it. It double flashed just as I had seen it and then it shot off at a sudden high rate of speed leaving visible light trails behind it. It was even traveling at the same kind of height above the rooftops of the building. Everything about it was exactly and precisely the same as what was here. Some of the camera angles even show afterwards when it shoots up red balls of light making formations similar to what my daughter had described and I had seen the ball of red light myself. It was an incident which took place over the Temple Mount in Israel, Jerusalem, in January of 2011. Make of that what you will, as that place has obviously ultra significant religious implications. That's either relevant or not at all. If this thing is just traveling all over the planet, then fine. Now, I'm not a religious person per se, although I would definitely class myself as being agnostic with an open mind. But if nothing else, then these experiences have definitely made me open to consider all possibilities. We can't afford to be closed-minded on this. Of course, I don't know what relevance that has to it being here. I mean, maybe whatever it is has traveled all over the world, like I say. If so, then surely it must have been seen by a large number of different people, surely. However, I genuinely believe I was just in the right place at the right time, or maybe the wrong place at the wrong time. I believe that it just happened to notice me and simply came in for a closer look. But based on what I've seen and from those videos, I can promise you that the Jerusalem UFO event was completely genuine. Yet somehow it has largely been dismissed as a hoax. Now, you have to realize something. A couple of the videos of that event uploaded to YouTube are clearly hoaxed. They even have the same audio laid over the top of those two different videos. It looks as if somebody has recorded a screen of a screen of a screen. It doesn't flash. It, it's as if somebody has put those out there to muddy the waters. Pretty effective to mix the genuine videos and then mix into it obviously hoaxed videos in order to kind of discredit the entire event itself. According to some reports, even a local Israeli weather station camera was later found to be missing four frames from the exact time of the event, which overlooked that precise location. So whatever it is, I saw it with my own eyes. I interacted with it up close and personal and I would take any lie detector test and I would bet my life on that fact. And that's the God's honest truth. Now I feel now after all this time that if what has happened to me can help influence other people out there to share their stories too, then that would be great. And failing that, I hope that it can help me also by getting it off my chest and putting it out there, maybe getting it off my mind a little. 
I hope it helps others either way, in some small way, you know. Now, I don't blame people for being skeptical, because I guess I would have been the same if it hadn't have happened to me personally. I know it sounds completely nuts. I get it. But instant dismissal, mocking and ridicule, I really don't get that. That's just being closed and also weak-minded in a way. I envy military personnel, I really do, because for the people that have gone public, my hat off to you. I respect you for that, I really do. But at least for those guys and girls, their encounters are backed up with hard evidence, radar and other data, with often dozens if not hundreds of other trusted military personnel. So for us regular civilians, we're pretty screwed. I mean, we have relatively no chance of being believed comparatively. I understand the reasons why, of course, but it's it's very damaging, you know. A lot of people go through PTSD after these events, these encounters. It messes up your world, really does. And there really isn't anyone to talk to about it. Now, if you Google, for the, from the UK, if you Google who to report a UFO sighting to, in the United Kingdom, you will find nothing, nowhere is listed. There's absolutely no way to report it officially anywhere from the UK. You can find the government's release of old files, UFO reports from previous decades, but there is no one to speak to. I've never spoken to my doctor, although at times I wished I had, but I'm not that kind, you know. If I hurt myself, I often just get on with it. I don't bother with doctors much. But I do, and I have really felt like I needed to uh, to get over this. And that's why I started this channel, it really is. I was hoping it would help me in some way. And, as I say, help others. So, no better time than now, huh? With what's going on in the world. So ultimately, I don't claim to know what they are or where they're coming from. Of course, I don't have the answers to that. I can only tell you what I saw, what I felt. The scary thing is that the truth to these questions is probably way weirder than any of us could ever imagine. And for that reason, I can say that I hope that it is as mundane as simply aliens. Anyway, I must say thank you for listening, and I really appreciate it. If you have had an encounter, you can always email me. It would be good for you to connect with someone that understands how you feel and what you've gone through. You can email me at mrufohunter at gmail.com. If you would like to talk about it and be on the show, you can do that too, whatever you prefer. But I wish you all well. I want you to take care of yourself and others, your loved ones, but even strangers. Look after everyone. Be nice to everyone. If everybody does that every day, we'd be living in a much nicer world, huh? Anyway, thanks for listening. Take care.